Jackson is the capital of the state of Mississippi, close to 200,000 people. 80% of the city is black, overwhelmingly working class, overwhelmingly impoverished. We're dealing with generations of mindset of slavery, what I call post-slavery syndrome. There are things that happened to us historically that has been passed through generations and it hasn't stopped. The Trump phenomenon is catching many people throughout the world by storm. Mississippi's been living with that since the Redeemer Constitution government of the 1890s in one form or another. Something has to be done and I think Cooperation Jackson is a good vehicle to help with that. What Cooperation Jackson is trying to do, you know, preserve the land, build economic basis about collective resources, creating the commons, and creating new social relationships. That's the core essence of what our program is about. With the Jackson Cush plan written over a decade ago, one of the things that was initiated through that plan was the idea of taking back the means of production for the working class here in Jackson, part of the Black Belt South. What we're building here is something called a solidarity economy, systems where we're doing work that's meaningful to us, and where we can feel like we have ownership of our labor. Let's focus on the transition of value. If I fix something for you, you may not have to pay it. It means you could do some child care for me. That you have something of value, whether you have no money at all, or if you do have a job. We have a Jackson Just Transition Plan, making Jackson a zero waste and a zero emission city. What really made the civil rights movement strong is that people really checked for each other. They really cared about one another. They ate together, they fought together, they cried together, they bled together. All of that is definitely gonna be needed because that's how we have been able to survive and be able to be resilient through all of this. How do we build our own economic base and build it on an anti-capitalist basis? We need to take the limited resource we have and then prioritize around need. Mississippi currently is 60% white, roughly, and 40% uh, uh, black. After Reconstruction, this was a majority black state, and it only transitioned from being a majority black state within the, the last 70 years, and that had some profound political consequences. Right before the Civil War, this was the richest state within the Union. How that wealth was accumulated was chattel slavery and the byproducts of chattel slavery cotton, and other cash crops. A lot of that accumulated wealth was also in timber. Enslaved Africans clear-cutting the old growth forest in order to create the cash crop economy. That timber wound up being used in the British fleet. Chattel slavery was concentrated in the western portion of the state, and the eastern portion was largely white working class folks. The only thing that they could afford oftentimes was the poor lands that the big planters didn't want, couldn't use. So most of the eastern part of the state is white. Most of the western part of the state is black. Now that creates a political division within the state that still exists to this day. Because of gerrymandering in the 90s, Mississippi now has a Republican supermajority state legislature and that actually got taken over by the Tea Party. So the Tea Party actually runs the state of Mississippi, not your old school Republican. And even that is now being redefined actively by Trump's rearticulation of the party. Now Mississippi is the poorest state in the union, still primarily agricultural based state, but the dominant thing is once again, trees. It's the descendants of that initial planter class, the few rich white families who owns and controls the, the means of production here. And they still run things in such a manner that still to this day, they use open forms of white supremacist populism to galvanize the majority of white working class around supporting a politics that only really benefits a small few. To our immediate east is Rankin County, majority white, where some of the most openly racist politicians live. The Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, the Aryan Nation, live there. The social aspect of white supremacy is that even though you might be as poor as hell, you're still better than this black person, you're still better than that uh, uh, immigrant. When Trump went to the wall in Texas to announce his campaign, the immediate thing that it brought to mind Ronald Reagan announced his 1979-80 presidential campaign right here in Mississippi by going to the city where Emmett Till was lynched. In many respects, Emmett Till's murder was the birth 
of the more militant, modern, quote unquote, civil rights movement. His mother having the courage to bring in the media and open that casket up. It exposed the United States on an international level, but from a conservative reactionary place, it's the start of, of what made America degenerate, what weakened it. So Trump knew that. Not only does he make his announcement, but he comes out with that stupid little hat, with that basic campaign, you know, make America great again. You know, a lot of people laughed at it, but to a lot of people who feel like America's the greatest thing since sliced bread, they've been taught that all their life, and they feel like they've been losing out. People didn't understand how deeply that resonated to a certain sector of folks. Now, you got to know something about Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers was not a man running around talking about no nonviolence. Don't throw no nonviolence on Medgar. Medgar was willing to take it to the line if he had to. He didn't go around talking violence, but if he had to take it to the line, but you better believe he was well organized and well prepared and he had tier levels of men prepared to do the work that needed to be done. This narrative that 54 was something new, it was actually a picking up the torch and a younger generation overcoming the fear of the repression that happened a decade earlier, Medgar Evers. The folks that were his key infrastructure were all radical labor organizers from the 1930s. If the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? For us in the United States, you know, this fight against white supremacy is a central one. And to think that you could just somehow institute uh, an egalitarian society without dealing the issue of race is actually going to repeat a lot of the, the mistakes. Land redistribution after the Civil War was betrayed. That basically locked black people into a new form of enslavement. The initial degree of black land ownership in this context was largely children produced from rape. Their fathers granted their children acres of land, often cases some choice productive land. That is one of the primary reasons groups like the Ku Klux Klan and the White Knights formed was to remove black folks off the land. What emerges from that is a serious quest from the end of slavery to the present of a black demand for land. Having something of your own that the Knight Riders can't come and take, having something where you can grow your own food and not be dependent upon the market, that's very deep in black culture. Waco. The New African, New Bethel incident, when the police came in, uh, the Detroit police came in there to try to shoot up. Everybody in that church, men, women, and children were having a peaceful demonstration to try to kill them. They were shooting under the pills. They were shooting the little children running and crying. Having lived through 
COINTEL Pro, the counterintelligence program, watching the FBI hunt members of your family and kick down doors. Most of COINTEL Pro was actually not on the books. It was actually illegal by law. Patriot Act made that all legal and then some. Within uh, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement and the New African People's Organizations, we sat down and said, you know, we are likely going to be targeted as a terrorist organization, an organization that has some terrorist links because of our history relative to some of the political prisoners and prisoners of war who were inside, were part of the New African Independence Movement. And then we just said, look, we can't keep doing some, some things in the same way. So a study group emerged out of that. That wind up over a period of time leading to the Jackson Cush Plan. The People's Assembly existed before the plan. That's one thing everybody should know. That component we see as the lead component of the Jackson Cush Plan. And then the other two pillars, you know, the independent electoral politics and the building the solidarity economy are really in some respects we see them as outgrowths of, of that core component, rightly or wrongly. We kind of tried to focus strategically on doing the electoral politics out of the assembly. Trumpway's election was a major disruption to a concerted plan of gentrification. Folks knew him from his law practice, doing capital murder cases and cases that nobody else would take pro bono and doing that for decades. He brought out 20,000 working class voters who don't normally show up. The initial strategy was we would get in office and then we would change the policy infrastructure within the city that would then enable a vehicle like Cooperation Jackson to be born on the 24th. February. Chokwe dies. I can remember being in office. I had talked to him earlier that day about a presentation. And I knew he was in the hospital, uh, but he was not a man who, who thought his life was in danger. He was still working. And so, you know, an entire movement just being kind of in shock, you know, like we, this was not in the plans. <laughs> there was a special election. His son ran in that election. He lost by a thin margin. He was young, and he didn't have the track record that his father had. I think the other factor, we didn't do everything with a mass orientation, and that was a mistake. There was no explanation for certain decisions. They just happened. As far as most people are concerned, it was like, same old, same old. Y'all just like everybody else. If I had to do it all over again, I would have pushed more for us doing the solidarity economy work before getting into the electoral politics. Uh, and I think in all, in all honesty, we did the electoral politics because that's what we knew how to do. I think we should have gotten out of our comfort zone, build that base up, build a new set of transformative relationships up, and then went for that. We thought it was very important that we demonstrate first and foremost that the actual movement was not dependent solely on electoral politics and was definitely not dependent on one individual. Through the vehicle of the Jackson Rising Conference, which was held in May 2014, we put the basic core committee that, that created Cooperation Jackson from that theory, mind you, of, of the Jackson Cush Plan, and then tried to put that theory into practice. We are deliberately trying to make it as mass as possible to include particularly younger white workers who we are trying to draw and attract in into our mix to, to work on developing the solidarity economy and then take that to the eastern portions of the state. Now embedded in that was this notion of taking the solidarity economy, taking particularly co-ops, worker co-ops. There was a history of cooperative experiments in the city and in the region. Most of the black farmers only survive by having very formal cooperative structures. So some of the, the co-ops that we have are, you know, the cafe, Freedom Farms and uh, Community Production Center, as well as the Green Team. And through those cooperatives, those who are members of that cooperative are not only members of the cooperative, but they have financial ownership in that as well. Is basically showing people that we control what it is that we do and that we have a say in what it is that we do. Now what that is, we're educating ourselves every day on. We know what the issues are. We know what the problems are. But I believe that nobody ever has the answer. That every day we move forward collectively, we'll eventually find out what that is. Of course, we're talking about food justice. We're having healthier food options for people. 
Um, and it's all a learning process, but slowly but surely we're getting there. Um, and my role for the cafe overall is just to have um, a relationship and with food and to educate people about how important that relationship with food is. We're considered what you call a food desert. There really isn't any fresh produce available. Majority of the grocery stores around here are um, a lot of that produce that is on the verge of going bad in other areas and then they'll bring it over here. Driving the Walmart is probably about 15 minutes minutes away from this location. And then you have McDade's, which is about five minutes away from this particular location. But a lot of people here don't have vehicles. So it's hard to get to that fresh food without there being something on site. All of the co-ops work um, to collectively together. So Freedom Farms Co-op is gonna provide the produce for the cafe and catering service. We have a, a lot of experienced farmers around here who help us out. But our crew is mainly young folks who ain't never farmed nothing in their life. So, you know, it's a constant learning experience for them. About a week ago, uh, they didn't know uh, some of the things back here, what they were. So they, they cut a bunch of herbs down that they didn't know. A lot of the, the dirt that we're recycling from other places or that they dig up, they're gonna put right there. Um, we got compost bins on the other side of the fence right there that you can see on your way out. A lot of people in, in our organization, in the community, will come and you know dump green foods, no meats and stuff like that into there, and that gets mulched right there into that dirt right there, which gets used in these beds right here. We're trying to buy this strip mall complex to create a cooperative grocery store and a greenhouse hydroponic farming system that will support the grocery. We're thinking about life and plants and the water that nurture us. So that's respecting the resources. That's us regenerating and planting back into the earth and so that it grows out and feeds us and nourishes us. In my culture, the way that I was raised, <laughs> the kitchen was the conversation starter. Once you have that food on the table, you have um, people available to consume this food, then you can start conversations. And talking about food itself, that's one big conversation. Because <laughs> a lot of people are um, not eating healthy and then they're, um, they're wanting to eat more healthier. But then when you open up that issue around food, other issues you have no other choice but to consume on other issues that the food is connected to as well. So it starts the bigger conversation. It's about having that conversation first, then educating ourselves on what the issues are, and then coming to a conclusion collectively on how to solve these issues. These two buildings that you see across the street here, uh, this is going to be our community production center. So the idea of us having a fabrication lab was to get the technology that's coming in the next generation to get ahead of the curve and learning that technology, democratizing that technology so that people in this community will be able to use it, determine its uses, advance it, and be able, begin to be able to produce everything that we need for ourselves as opposed to relying on the usual capitalist means of acquiring whatever goods and services that you need. The equipment that we'll have in here, the things that are popularized are 3D printers, laser cutters, water cutters, the ability to make electronics, program electronics, to make physical goods with molding and casting, to cut wood, to cut metal, to shape wood, to shape metal, to shape plastic, and any number of things. Initially, this facility is going to focus on education, so we'll pull in some students from local universities. We'll also put in some community members. We'll maybe even pull in some people from outside of the community um, to do the, the first couple of waves of learning. Uh, but once this is up and running and we've done a good bit of education and have a sufficient amount of people that can teach the equipment, uh, teach the material, then this building is going to be a much more open and community space. It'll be what we call our maker space. Once that's up and running, we hope to sort of replicate the equipment that we'll have in that building and open this up to the community. So if people want to build their own houses, use certain uh, bits of technology, use the tools that we have, It'll be sort of open sharing community space where people will be able to come in and make the things that they want after getting the training on the, on the equipment that we'd have in that building. But it's also going to be a two-way exchange because you got a lot of people in this community with a lot of skills in farming, mechanics, uh, businesses, uh, and just about anything that you can imagine. Uh, Jackson is, uh, Black Jackson is income poor but not experience poor. Uh, there's a lot of people with a lot of skills here.
envisioning a new economy, which I know is going to be extremely hard because we currently run off of this, you know, system where you got to have money, got to have money. But, you know, really evaluating and thinking about like, what can I, what do I need and what do I want? The just transition piece requires a lot of creativity to address the, the, the inequality issues to make it, I think, far more practical and less abstract. How does this sit with 50% unemployment in this city? We have a campaign called the Union Co-op Initiative where we're trying to engage the unions and it's a struggle. It's really three unions that support it. The teachers union, JFT, May CWA, which is the public employees, and the UAW, United Auto Workers. Organized labor in the United States is basically down to 10%. Most of that is public sector workers. You know, the unions have never really been strong in Mississippi. Never. Nissan is the factory um, that's here. They will say how they do not need a union. They have open door policy. We find out that that's not true. They ignore a lot of the complaints or grievances that the workers have. I wouldn't say Nissan don't recognize unions. They don't recognize unions in the United States. They have unions all over the world in all the plants except of the three here in the United States. The Nissan workers trying to unionize and there were instances where folks had guns pulled out on them. It definitely turned into white against black and the plant was majority black where white workers were getting things that the black workers weren't getting. Mississippi is still racist. Um, the practices of this state is racist and that's the whole reason they came here. The Canton plant is the most producing plant out of all the Nissan plants. It's profits more than other Nissan plants. Yet we still get paid to less, we get treated to worse. There were a number of workers at one point who were testing positive for cocaine and marijuana who had been working there for years or were about to be turned over into full-time employees. One of those workers were white, the other eight were black. There's a clinic right across the street from that plant. Those folks went right across the street to get a drug test. Uh, for what they were told they were tested positive for and it tested negative. There was one white man who went across the street, did the same process, his job was given back. I took hair samples, I did urine samples, I took blood samples, they wouldn't accept none of them. And then they didn't show me the results that they said I failed. I didn't see none of those either, they just walked me out the door. People have compared it to plantations and so corporations are looking to come to places like Mississippi because they know that um, you know folks are not employed or there's not a lot of opportunity for employment. One of the things that we're really trying to say, look, you're one of the bodies, working class entity, that has a tremendous amount of resources in the case of the AFL-CIO. You guys can serve as a bank to, for your own development if you so choose, right? An investment in the development of your own members, if you just want to start there in their future. You can do your own just transition. A lot of the unions forget that they once had co-ops internal to their own operation to take care of many of the social services that people needed before the welfare state created those things. Like unions actually used to have that in shop. This may sound funny to a lot of people, but the lead of our just transition campaign it's focused right now around human rights budgeting. We have to have a material foundation in order to lay the transition, not saying we're just automatically going to pay police or we're just automatically going to pave the roads, but like, no, we may not need them. We may not want them. The budget has to be determined by the democratic priorities that are expressed from the assembly. We are aware the pie is limited. We're aware that the tax revenue is, is decreasing. But we're trying to argue with our own folks and say that's the wrong way of looking at it, as opposed to what are, the, what are the skills and the resources we do have in the community that are not being tapped into, that are not being utilized, that could be tapped into if we create a real broad, dynamic solidarity system. So let's say we can move the municipality to creating a time banking system and somebody could exchange some labor around installing a solar system for a bill being paid. We got all these empty houses out here, but we got all these people who have the skills to fix them. Like, that's up to us. It's not a limitation that we have to accept. That's what we're trying to put to the city. That's a crisis of imagination. We can get all that fixed if we want to. We just have to reprioritize some things. It's a kind of an argument to the city. We're not asking you to, to do anything, but get out the way. Here in Jackson, I know there's other organizations and there's other um, cooperatives that are developing.
We've got a, an eight block area where we're working to build a sustainable model neighborhood from the inside out ground up using all of our blighted and abandoned property and the skills of the people that live here. We build everything using only salvage materials. The whole idea is like to use construction, um, food, food production and folk art to renew and revitalize the neighborhood. We moved here four years ago and we bought a house. We bought this house here for $1,500. Everybody's extremely poor, nobody's working, about a 90% unemployment rate. We started having neighborhood meetings and what we realized really quickly was that everybody could articulate where they would go if. Mm -hmm. If they had more money, if they, you know, had a better job. That's how we started like saying, okay, well, you know, if they can see what their ideal place would be, well, why not start organizing with that saying like, look, you know, we can own this space and we can start to create what we can see. We did a skills assessment and we found that 90% of the residents actually have a farming background, a farming skill. And we had a lot of land and this where the farm is was the neighborhood dumping ground and the people wanted to figure out how to clean it up. So we decided to put a farm there that actually looks like a landscape cottage garden because of the trauma associated with farming. So that is like a big part of our challenge is like getting people, although they have that skill, back into growing food you know, to make money. Because that's, that's like the number one thing that people want to do here is they want to make money. We have like a main street. So right now we're working to build a neighborhood economy. So we have to be able to make the place feel safe enough for people with disposable income to come in and buy products that we produce. We have a youth apprentice program. So we work with the neighborhood youth, you know, teaching them different skills. So everything that is done here is done by the people that live here. We call it neighbor labor and they're paid. As we start to make the place feel safe, that's when organized capital comes in and displaces people. So we bought all of the vacant land. Uh, so we own 65 properties as a neighborhood collective. It's more like a quiet radicalism, our approach, you know, because we're not ready to raise our head. You know, you raise your head, it gets chopped off. You know what I mean? So we're kind of quietly here building an infrastructure that will be able to resist the forces that we know will come as soon as we build something that is really great. A core part of the program is doing the community land trust so that we decommodify land as much as possible. Eventually we'll take more and more people away from the urgency of having to worry about having a roof over my head and paying ground rent and paying rent you know, which pushes you and drives you in a certain sense to have to engage the market on the market's terms. It has to become a communal entity and something that we create communal rules around how to use, how to protect, how to preserve, how to regenerate. And that's how we wind up getting this building and then using this as a base to grow out and expand. We've placed more of a priority on, on actually, in a certain sense, acquiring uh, the land and uh, even ahead of kind of building uh, uh, co-ops. And we bank a premium. We don't. We don't build on anything that we don't own. Like that's a, uh, that's a principle of ours. Because if you know, we feel that if the, if the the community land trust owns it, and we put some institution on it, a co-op that does, does it survive or something like that, you can repurpose the use of that for something else, as opposed to having to go rent someplace or your business being driven out of business because you the, the landlord forces the rent up on you. This street is very strategic for us. If you turn this way, you are literally a five minute walk from downtown. A mile and a half down this road is the Jackson Zoo. It's the largest golf course in the city of Jackson. And then right behind that is the original airport. And then right behind that, there's a free trade zone. You have this, this downtown expanse of new businesses they want to create that connect people to the zoo. This way is like your, you know, your due north and the gentrification is coming down this way. We've become, I would argue, uh, a roadblock uh, by, in, in many respects, fortifying this institution. Most of this block is owned by that organization. That organization is a Christian-based homeless center. It's the largest homeless service provider in the state of Mississippi. The Chamber of Commerce, they've been trying to remove them from this block for a long time. Between basically two organizations, we now own 90% of this block. So if we don't sell, there's no pressure for them to have to move their operation. It means that the forces of gentrification have less of an incentive to come here. And this is a communally owned space, it's not individually owned. And this is a community owned space, it's not individually owned. Options for the community of how land ownership and things can be different to serve different purposes.
We trying to learn how to be democratic. We don't know how to do that. I've never lived in a democratic society. I really don't know what that looks like. We are in a period right now <clears throat> where there's a lot of de intense debate around which way to go forward. I, for instance, I didn't want and was trying to give a warning about Chokwe Antar running for mayor this time. It was my analysis that without a real strong social movement that was dictating the terms, that we were going to be in a, in a position of being dictated to by capital to actually enforce the austerity that we've been fighting all along. People believing that their agency actually counts and matters, I think is more important than expedient victories. The social movement in Jackson the last couple of years was not as strong as it was and has been a couple of years prior. A lot of that transitioned into Chokwe's campaign committee and then Chokwe Antar's campaign committee. Who should be in the lead? The social movement or the like the party apparatus and the government apparatus? And I'm on the side that at all times, at all times, the social movement should be the driving force, has to be the driving force. We have the highest number of black elected officials in the country, bar none, and we're still the poorest state. That's been the case basically since 1972. You know, as neoliberalism continues to advance, you wind up adopting elements of its logic, which force you to look at politics as a market exchange as opposed to a political practice. There was a phrase I first heard in the 80s from the social movements in Venezuela, and it's recently coming back to the forefront of my mind and my imagination. We don't want to be the government, we want to govern.